you're slowly going blind and we have no way of stopping it. It's a conversation I have almost on a daily basis with patients who have severe dry macular degeneration. Advanced dry macular degeneration is such a frustrating and difficult disease for both patients and doctors because it causes patients to progressively go blind. In fact, advanced dry macular degeneration is responsible for 20% of all cases of legal blindness in North America. And despite the large effects it has on the quality of life of patients, we eye doctors really haven't had any good treatment options for it. Sure, we can offer low vision aids like magnifying glasses, but basically all we could do is watch patients deteriorate and go blind before our eyes without any way to slow down or treat the disease. That is, until now. In 2023, we saw approvals from the FDA for two new groundbreaking medications, Cyfovri and Iservay. These two new medications have been shown in clinical trials to reportedly help prevent the progression of dry macular degeneration, and they symbolize a turning point in ophthalmology where we now have something to offer to patients with debilitating dry macular degeneration. In this video, I'm going to tell you all about these two new medications. We're going to review the clinical studies, the medication's effects, which patients would benefit from them, and most importantly, I'm also going to review the medication safety profile and some concerns that eye doctors have raised regarding these medications. I'm also going to discuss some worrisome data about why we may not want to rush into giving these medications to our patients with severe dry macular degeneration. By the end of this video, I want you to know as much about the latest treatments for dry macular degeneration as the eye doctor treating you. By the way, I'm Dr. Michael Chua. I'm a board certified ophthalmologist with Puente Hills Eye Care, and I make videos to help you see better, look better, and feel better too. So let's take a step back and first understand what macular degeneration is. Age-related macular degeneration, or AMD, is a progressive retinal disease affecting the macula, the central part of the retina, responsible for sharp central vision. According to the National Eye Institute, AMD is the number one leading cause of blindness and vision loss in patients age 60 and older. There are two main forms of AMD. There's the dry form and the wet form, and they have different underlying causes, they cause different changes in the retina, and they have different treatments. In wet AMD, we see new abnormal blood vessels that grow into the retina. These vessels are fragile and tend to leak fluid or bleed, causing sudden and severe vision loss. Fortunately, we do have effective treatments for wet AMD, which are injections of a class of medications called anti-VEGF medications, such as Avastin or Ilea. Usually, we give these eye injections every month to control the leaking and growth of these abnormal blood vessels. In dry AMD, we see the accumulation of these yellow deposits under the retina called drusen. Drusen are made up primarily of fat, proteins, and basically built up waste products and trash from retinal cells. Scientists are still trying to figure out why some people develop drusen, but the leading theories are that there's dysfunction of retinal pigment epithelium, or RPE cells. You can think of RPE cells as basically the support cells of the retina. The star of the show in the retina are the photoreceptors. These cells convert the light that comes into our eyes from the world around us, they take that light and convert it into electrical signals which get sent to our brain, allowing us to see. But the process of taking light and converting it into electricity takes a lot of energy and also produces a lot of waste products in the process. The RPE cells are responsible for helping to clean up all the waste products produced by the photoreceptors. Research has shown that in patients with dry macular degeneration, these RPE cells are dysfunctional and are unable to adequately clean up all the waste products from photoreceptors. As these waste products build up under the retina, we can see the development of drusen. Unfortunately, as dry macular degeneration gets worse and worse, we see more dysfunction of RPE cells, and they can eventually start to atrophy or die away. As these RPE cells die, since there's no supporting cells for the photoreceptors, then the photoreceptor cells can start to die away as well. When we start to see these RPE and photoreceptors die away in atrophy, we call this geographic atrophy, which is the advanced form of dry AMD. At first, we may only see certain areas of the retina with geographic atrophy. But unfortunately, with time, we often see more and more cells die away and the area of atrophy begins to grow. As the area of atrophy grows, we lose more and more vision. And if this area of atrophy includes our central retina or our fovea, which is responsible for our central vision, then this can really disrupt our quality of life. Think about how important central vision is to everyday life. Our sharp central vision allows us to read, to look at the faces of our family members, and to look at cell phones and computers. When patients lose their central vision, it's debilitating. And the tough part about dry AMD is, until recently, there was not much we eye doctors could offer to patients. Sure, there are the AREDS2 supplements, which have been shown to help prevent the progression of macular degeneration in patients with moderate dry AMD, but this effect is modest. Besides these AREDS2 vitamins, all we can really do is watch patients slowly lose their vision and offer magnifying glasses when it becomes too difficult to read. But recently, scientists have made groundbreaking discoveries into understanding how exactly dry AMD and geographic atrophy develops. It turns out that the complement pathway plays a large role in the progression of geographic atrophy. Now, 
If someone who went to medical school is watching this video, they probably shuddered or threw up in their mouth a little bit when they heard the words complement pathway. It's one of those things we learn in medical school like the Krebs cycle or the coagulation cascade, and we basically forget those things immediately after taking the test on them. Anyway, the complement pathway or cascade is this complex system of proteins which make up a specialized arm of our immune system. Usually, the complement system allows our immune system to attack bacteria and other microbes in our bodies by causing inflammation and by activating the cell-killing membrane attack complex, which causes cells to burst and die. Several research studies have shown that the complement system in our retina becomes uncontrolled or dysregulated in macular degeneration. And when this complement system becomes activated, it causes inflammation as well as cell death of our retinal pigment epithelial cells. This complement pathway is also important for clearing away damaged or dead cells. The complement system can add tags to injured cells marking them to be eaten up or cleared away by our immune cells. Scientists and pharmaceutical companies have used this newfound knowledge about the complement system and macular degeneration to design medications to help control the dysregulated complement system that we see in macular degeneration. Cyfovri, which received FDA approval in February 2023, and Isorbate, which received FDA approval in August 2023, both work by inhibiting or downregulating the complement system. These medications are very important to our patients because, remember, prior to 2023, for all of human history, we have never had any medication besides the AREDS2 vitamin to treat patients with dry macular degeneration. And now, we have two. Cyfovri works by inhibiting C3 in the complement pathway, and Isorbe works by inhibiting C5 in the complement pathway. So with both medications, the goal is to tamp down the complement system. They are both given by intravitreal injection, meaning we use a needle to inject this medication into the vitreous or the jelly-like interior portion of the eye. This allows us to deliver the medication directly to the retina. With time though, the medication becomes absorbed, so it's not a one-time treatment. Usually, these injections need to be given every one or two months to sustain their effect. So it can be quite a burden for patients to come into the eye doctor's office every month to receive an injection. Let's first talk about Cyfovri. Like we mentioned before, Cyfovri is a C3 complement system inhibitor and was approved by the FDA in February 2023. Most of our data about Cyfovri comes from two phase three clinical trials, the OAKS and Derby trials. These were randomized double-blinded control trials which compared injection with Cyfovri either every month or every other month versus sham injections, meaning injections with no active medication injected into the eye. And the primary endpoint in these studies was rate of geographic lesion growth. Basically, they wanted to answer the question whether their medication was able to slow down the growth and spread of retinal and RPE atrophy or cell death that we see in geographic atrophy. So what they did was they took special retinal photos of patients called fundus autofluorescence. In fundus autofluorescence photos, the damaged areas where cell death has occurred shows up as dark spots and regular retinal tissue shows up a little bit brighter. These dark spots tell us how much of the retina is affected and how severe the condition is. What we can also see in these fundus autofluorescence photos is what's called the border zone, which shows up even brighter than normal. The increased brightness in these areas along the border can signify that these cells are getting injured and under stress. And it could mean that, unfortunately, these cells can die away soon and the condition will get worse. So basically, the researchers took the autofluorescence retinal photos of every patient before starting treatment, and then they took follow-up photos every few months. They then measured the exact area of geographic atrophy, basically the dark areas where the cells have died, and checked to see if there was any difference in how fast these areas of cell death were growing. The latest 24-month pooled data from these trials showed that monthly injection with Cyfovri slowed down atrophy growth by 22%, and injections every other month slowed down atrophy growth by 18%. But just looking at how big of an area of retinal atrophy you have is just one measure of this condition. If these medications help to prevent areas of atrophy from getting larger, that's great. But what really matters for patients is how that translates to saving and preserving their vision. We already talked about the devastating effects of vision loss from geographic atrophy. And that's basically the whole point of these medications, right? To avoid patients from suffering debilitating vision loss that causes them to lose their independence. Now, it can actually be quite tricky to quantify vision quality for a condition like geographic atrophy. Of course, there's the classic vision test, visual acuity, where you read letters that progressively get smaller. But for a disease like geographic atrophy, what if you have an area of atrophy that's outside the center of your vision? Then, even if it's growing and you're losing vision, you might still have pretty good central visual acuity, so your visual acuity measurements won't really capture the whole picture. We have many other measures of your functional vision. The vision you use in everyday life, things like reading speed or the functional reading independence index score, which is basically a measure of the independence that patients have in performing everyday activities that require reading, like reading a prescription bottle or writing a check. We also have the National Eye Institute Visual Function Questionnaire, 
which is a 25 item questionnaire that measures how a person's eyesight affects their quality of life. Higher scores indicate better visual function and quality of life, meaning your vision is less of a problem for you. If we look at all these measures of vision, Unfortunately, the results from the Oaks and Derby trials for Cyphovery are underwhelming. This table shows a summary of visual function results for patients who received Cyphovery in the clinical trials. We see that in all functional measurements of vision, including visual acuity, reading speed, functional reading independence index, and National Eye Institute visual functional questionnaires, we see no statistically significant improvement in vision. I mean, even in Apelis' own press release, by the way, Apelis is the company that makes Cyphovery, they announced, Consistent with expectations, no clinically meaningful difference in key functional endpoints observed at 24 months. That's kind of a weird thing to say for a medication. They expected that there would be no meaningful difference in functional visual endpoints after 24 months. They're saying that they never expected for vision to be better for patients. But then what's the point of the medication? And so the lack of functional benefits seen in patients treated with Cyphovery raises a very big and important question. We see from the data that Cyphovery was shown to significantly decrease the rate of expansion of retinal atrophy as measured in retinal autofluorescence photos, which is a good thing. But what we also see is that this did not translate into any perceivable vision benefit. And so we eye doctors need to remember, we're not just treating retinal photos, we're treating you, the person sitting in front of us. What matters is your vision and your quality of life not how your retinal photos look. How is it that this medication helps to decrease the rate of atrophy, but not confer any vision benefit? Wouldn't you think if the area of cell death is not getting bigger, shouldn't the patient's vision be better in some measurable way compared to someone else whose area of atrophy is getting worse and bigger? Well, like so many things in medicine and scientific research, it's all about the details. One possible explanation to reconcile this discrepancy is that those cells at the border zone that we see in autofluorescence at the edges of the areas of atrophy, perhaps they're already injured and functionally useless. They're just dead weight and they're not making any meaningful contribution to our vision. And remember, what's one of the functions of our complement system? It's to tag injured cells so they can be cleared away. And so if we inhibit the complement system with one of these new macular degeneration medications like Cyphovery, it's possible that all we're doing is preserving these already injured and useless cells from getting cleared away. Because if these injured cells get cleared away, then we would see the area of atrophy grow. But if the complement system is downregulated, and so we're decreasing our eye's ability to clear away injured cells, then the area of atrophy technically is not getting bigger, but who cares if these injured cells aren't working anyway, right? And so this is why choosing the relevant endpoint when designing a research study or medication is so critical. There's already commercials and brochures out there, you may have seen them, touting the ability of Cyphovery to decrease the rate of atrophy expansion in patients with macular degeneration. But when you actually dig into the details and read the published peer-reviewed clinical trials, you find that there's no change in vision. Let's hypothetically say I designed a new treatment that shrinks tumors in patients with cancer. And I show on CT scans that, look, my treatment works. The tumors are getting smaller. But if my clinical data shows that my treatment has zero effect on patient quality of life, no effects on rates of metastasis, no effects on patient survival, or any other functional benefit, would you want to receive my treatment just to shrink the tumor on CT scans? And we haven't even begun discussing the side effect profile yet. Before we discuss the side effects for Cyphovery, I want to tell you about my optimized newsletter. If you want science-backed tips on how to protect your vision and health delivered straight to your inbox, you can sign up for my optimized newsletter at michaelchuamd.com. Let's take a look at the adverse effects or side effect profile reported in the clinical trials. This table comes from the prescribing information brochure that comes with every vial of Cyphobri. It has information like how to give the medication and it has nice diagrams showing you how to prepare it. It also includes reported adverse effects. So let's take a look. PM stands for patients who receive Cyphobri monthly and PEOM stands for patients who receive Cyphobri every other month. People in the sham group are the ones who receive placebo medications. Patients who received monthly injections of Cyphobri had a 12% risk of developing wet macular degeneration in addition to their dry macular degeneration. And patients who receive Cyphobri every other month had a 7% risk of developing wet macular degeneration compared with only 3% risk in the placebo group. So receiving Cyphobri increases your risk of developing retinal swelling or bleeding, which may require you to receive even more additional injections or anti-VEGF medications like Avastin or Ilea to treat your new wet AMD problem. Here's another interesting finding. Patients who received Cyphobri monthly had a 4% risk of developing eye inflammation, and patients who received the medication every other month had a 2% risk while patients who received the placebo had a less than 1% risk of developing eye inflammation. So we see higher rates of eye inflammation in the Cyphovery groups. Another finding I don't really have a good explanation for. If we examine the rates of death in the different treatment groups, 
we see a 6.7 rate of death in patients treated monthly, a 3.6% rate of death in the treated every other month group, and a 3.8% rate of death in the placebo group. So we're seeing a higher rate of death in the monthly treatment group. One more concerning adverse effect was optic ischemic neuropathy, which is basically an eye condition in which there's decreased blood flow to the optic nerve and can lead to optic nerve damage and vision loss. We see an optic ischemic neuropathy rate of 1.7% in patients treated monthly, 0.2% in patients treated every other month, and 0% in patients who receive placebo. So a higher rate of ischemic optic neuropathy in patients who receive Cyphovery monthly. Another particular side effect associated with Cyphovery that was discovered after it was released is retinal vasculitis. Retinal vasculitis means basically that there's inflammation of the blood vessels in the retina, which can lead to occlusion or leakage of the blood vessels, which can affect the blood supply to the retinal tissue. This condition can lead to permanent vision loss. After Cyphovery received FDA approval and was released to the public, cases of retinal vasculitis started popping up in patients who received the medication. This led to many headlines and multiple investigations as to why these side effects were occurring. As of the latest update in October 2023, there have been 10 confirmed events of retinal vasculitis. Six patients recovered vision either fully or partially, three patients have severe vision loss that likely won't come back, and one outcome is still pending. So when we add everything together, no established functional vision benefit with increased risk of side effects of developing wet AMD, eye inflammation, optic ischemic neuropathy, and retinal vasculitis. And we also didn't even mention the cost. Each of these injections is about $2,000 per eye. And when you're receiving them every month, maybe in both eyes, you can see how this cost can add up very quickly, either for you or for your insurance company. Not to mention the hassle of an eye injection every month, as well as all the time you spend traveling to and from your eye doctor and waiting in the doctor's office. Okay, so what about eye survey? That's the other new medication for geographic atrophy that received FDA approval in August 2023. Ivoric Bio, or the company that makes Iserve, has shared the results from their phase 3 clinical trials, which are called the GATHER trials. They reported a 14.3% reduction in the rate of growth of area of geographic atrophy over 12 months for patients who received Iserve versus sham injections. But like the Cyphovery studies, there was no difference in visual acuity observed in the patients who received Iserve versus those who didn't. In terms of side effect profile, from the prescribing information insert, we see increased rates of elevated eye pressure, 9% in the Iserve group versus 1% in the sham group, as well as increased rates of choroidal neovascularization, or basically development of leaky blood vessels like we see in wet macular degeneration, which causes swelling and bleeding in the retina. We see a 7% rate of neovascularization in the Iserve group and 4% in the sham group. And so we're seeing a similar picture emerge for Iserve as well. We see that the researchers are reporting that the medication helps to slow the growth of the area of geographic atrophy. But, and this is a big but, there is no reported functional visual benefit with the treatment. So in this video, I shared with you all the latest information and data regarding the two newest treatments for dry macular degeneration. I hope it's a useful starting point so you can have a more in-depth discussion with your eye doctor. Now, what may happen in the coming months, and we have to be very careful about this, is that oftentimes, after the results from clinical trials are published, companies release post ad hoc analysis of the data. What this means is that after the data has already come in from their clinical trials, the researchers can dig through the data to see if there's any ways they can repackage the results to make it significant. They may say, a certain subgroup of patients, perhaps those with areas of atrophy, just to the side of the fovea with an area of a certain size, those are the patients who showed a benefit in vision. The problem though is that Maybe they needed to run their analysis 1,000 times before finding this particular subgroup of patients. You see, eventually, if you run the analysis enough times and keep subgrouping patients just by broad chance and coincidence, you'll eventually find a statistically significant positive result. That's why it's so important in terms of clinical study design that you define your specific endpoints, define what variables you'll be measuring to determine whether your treatment is successful before the trial starts and before you see any data. That way, you won't be biased in just trying to find a positive result in any way that you can. For example, if we look at the clinical trial data from the iSurvey studies, we see that it started in 2016. And their stated outcome measure, the variable that they would use to determine if the treatment was successful or not, was visual acuity. But if you look at the study information from 2017, so at this point, the study has already been going on for a year, the primary outcome somehow changed the change in the rate of geographic atrophy. In terms of scientific experiments, it's usually a no-no to change your endpoints after the study has already started because it's possible that now you have access to the data coming in, you can see that maybe your trial is failing, but you can just change your endpoint to something that would show that it's a positive result instead. The truth is, I don't know why the researchers for Iserbay decided to change their primary endpoint after the study had already started. I don't know if they had access to their study data before changing the endpoints, but you should at least keep this fact in mind when you look at the results. Now, 
Having said all this, if there's new data showing that these treatments do provide a visual benefit to patients, then of course I can reconsider. But now that you have the latest data about these treatments, you can make a more informed decision about your eye care. In any case, we'll need more time and more studies to figure out who, if anyone, would be a good candidate for these medications. But despite all that, these medications are an important stepping stone in our ultimate quest to finally find an effective treatment for progressive, dry macular degeneration. If you live in the Los Angeles, Orange County, or Inland Empire area and would like to get an eye exam or to get checked for macular degeneration, feel free to visit our website or give our phone number a call to make an appointment today. And if you made it this far into the video, that means you're probably really motivated to learn more about how to take care of your vision and health. You can watch my video here to learn about the best science-backed ways to prevent macular degeneration.